Good morning, and welcome to Brunswick Corporation's second quarter 2021 earnings conference call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer period. Today's meeting will be recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to introduce Brent Dahl, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. With me on the call this morning are Dave Falks, Brunswick CEO, and Ryan Gloom, CFO. Before we begin with our prepared remarks, I would like to remind everyone that during this call, our comments will include certain forward-looking statements about future results. Please keep in mind that our actual results could differ materially from these expectations. For details on the factors to consider, please refer to our recent SEC filings in today's press release. All of these documents are available on our website at brunswick.com. During our presentation, we will be referring to certain non-GAAP financial information. Reconciliations of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures are provided in the appendix to this presentation and the reconciliation sections of the consolidated financial statements accompanying today's results. I will now turn the call over to Dave. Thanks, Brent, and good morning, everyone. Our businesses had another outstanding quarter. We closed the first half of 2021 by delivering record results as a result of continuing strong retail demand, outstanding operational performance, and success in mitigating material supply and labor challenges. All of our businesses delivered exceptional growth during the quarter. Our propulsion business continued to realize strong outboard market share gains, leveraging the strongest product lineup in the industry. Our parts and accessories businesses continue to benefit from robust aftermarket demand driven by elevated boating participation. And our boat business posted its second consecutive quarter of double-digit adjusted operating margins, despite significant supply chain, transportation, and labor challenges. Robust retail demand for our products in the first half of the year has driven field inventory levels to the lowest level in decades at approximately nine weeks on hand. And we are progressing our efforts to efficiently increase capacity across several of our facilities to satisfy orders from our global customer base and begin to replenish the pipeline. As many of you know, we've also had a busy few months on the M&A front. At the end of the quarter, our advanced systems group significantly expanded its product and brand portfolio by announcing the signing of a definitive agreement to purchase Navico, an industry leader in marine electronics. In addition, we announced in early July that Freedom has expanded into Spain through the acquisition of Phenotic Club. I'll touch on both these exciting transactions later in our discussion. Given the unique demand and inventory environment, together with continued strong boat usage through the prime season, which drives P&A sales, we have improved visibility on our ability to deliver against an extremely favorable outlook for the remainder of 2021. And consequently, we have increased our 2021 guidance. Before we discuss the results for the quarter, I wanted to share with you some updated demographic insights through the first half of 2021 and comparisons with the favorable trends we experienced in 2020 versus 2019 in the industry. I'm happy to report that we are not seeing any change in the significant metrics we shared with you during our first quarter earnings call in April. Brunswick's average boat buyer age continues to be two years younger than the industry average. Additionally, Brunswick's first time boat buyers continue to be younger than our overall boat buyer demographic and three years younger than the industry. First time boat buyers are trending more female than they did in 2020 and Brunswick over indexes to the industry by approximately 800 basis points. In Freedom Boat Club, the average Freedom member continues to be almost three years younger than our typical boat buying customer. And female Freedom members make up approximately 35% of our member base. We continue to outperform the industry in attracting younger and more diverse first time boat buyers, positioning us for very strong growth in years to come. These trends are an extremely important validation of our strategy to secure a healthy future for Brunswick 
and are also favorable for the entire marine industry. I also wanted to share with you some awards that Brunswick received during the second quarter that provide more strategic proof points. Brunswick received six 2021 Boating Industry Top Product Awards, including for the Mercury Marine V12 600 horsepower Verado and the c 370 Sundancer Outboard we highlighted recently, but also for our Bayliner Element M15 entry-level boat, BEP Smart Battery Hub, Atwood Sahara Mark II Automatic Bilge Pump, and MotorGuide's XI3 Kayak Trolling Motor. Brunswick has also been recognized by Forbes for the second year in a row as one of the best employers for women and ranked second overall in the engineering and manufacturing category. The winners were chosen based on a survey of 50,000 U.S. employees working for companies employing at least 1,000 people in their U.S. operations, and only 300 companies made the final list from the thousands of companies that were considered for the honor. Finally, Brunswick recently had three employees and a Freedom Boat Club franchisee, Bev Rosella, honored with a Women Making Waves Award from Boating Industry Magazine. We are very proud of these women leaders. As you know, equal opportunity, inclusion, and diversity are cornerstones of our culture. I'll now provide some second quarter highlights on our segments and the overall marine market. Our propulsion business continues to gain significant retail market share in outboard engines, especially in the higher horsepower categories where we have focused higher levels of investment in recent years. For the first half of the year, Mercury has gained share in each horsepower category over 75 horsepower, with outsized gains in nodes in excess of 200 horsepower. I'm also pleased to announce that we began shipping the new 600 horsepower V12 Verado engine in late June, and as anticipated, demand has been extremely strong. We're essentially sold out of the V12 production slots for the remainder of 2021. And we estimate that just during the back half of 2021, we will sell more outboard engines in this above 500 horsepower class than was sold in the entire prior history of the outboard industry. Given the surging demand in the current environment and new product launches planned in the coming years, Mercury is accelerating additional capacity investment at its primary manufacturing center in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, in order to maximize its ability to serve the market and capture further share. Our parts and accessories businesses experienced significant top line and earnings growth and significantly overdrove expectations in the quarter due to outstanding execution, robust aftermarket demand driven by elevated boating participation, and favorable weather conditions in many areas. The Advanced Systems Group, which has a larger OEM component to its business and also serves certain non-marine segments, benefited from prior year comparisons as a result of Q2 2020 customer COVID-related plant shutdowns. As a result, ASG realized significant growth across all product categories and delivered strong operating margins that were accretive to the overall segment. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, in late June, our advanced systems group strengthened its product and brand portfolio and significantly expanded its scale and capabilities by announcing the signing of a definitive agreement to purchase Navico. This action will further accelerate our ACES strategy and will enhance our ability to provide complete, innovative digital solutions to our consumers and comprehensive integrated systems offerings to our OEM customers. We believe this transaction will close in the second half of 2021. Our boat segment had another outstanding quarter, posting its second consecutive quarter of double-digit adjusted operating margins despite significant supply chain uncertainty while delivering output consistent with our production plans for the year. We ended the second quarter with historically low pipeline inventory levels due to consistent strong retail demand for our products. Given the continued robust retail demand and our dealers' continued desire to take all available product, our 2021 production slots are now sold out for the calendar year with five brands completely sold out through the 2022 model year. In fact, the sum of our wholesale orders 
for 2022 model year product is already roughly equal to our projected 2021 full-year wholesale boat group revenue. We continue to hire additional new production employees at most facilities to maintain production consistent with our stated plan. We remain on track with our plans to ramp up and staff the Palm Coast facility and expand our operations at Reynosa and Portugal. Additionally, we've identified capital efficient investment options to further raise capacity to approximately 50,000 annual production units by 2023, should this volume of product be required. Freedom Boat Club also continues to exceed our expectations, growing both organically and through acquisition with a young and diverse customer base. With the recently announced acquisition of Phonautic Club and expansion into Spain, Freedom now has 314 locations and 44,000 memberships network-wide and is closing in on 4,000 boats in the overall Freedom fleet, with an increasing percentage of Brunswick product. The outstanding operational and financial performance I've been discussing has not been without some external challenges that our businesses continue to manage and mitigate sometimes on a daily basis. Our supply chain teams in particular have performed extremely well. Winter storms in late first quarter and resulting power outages in central and southern United States disrupted the supply of oil-based resin and foam products throughout the second quarter, while tight semiconductor supply, raw material shortages and transportation disruption and resulting cost increases continue to present challenges which we are actively managing. As a result, our businesses have implemented price increases that are higher than normal, but we believe are generally at the lower end of those implemented across the industry. The global reach of our supply network and our unique scale in the marine industry, together with our purposeful vertical integration, have so far enabled us to mitigate these challenges and keep our production plans on track for 2021. I want to thank our supply chain and operations teams, as well as our third-party supply partners, for continuing to work together to ensure the manufacturing continuity necessary to satisfy our robust market demand. Finally, labor conditions remain tight in many locations in which we manufacture product but our talent acquisition teams have been working hard and successfully to add manufacturing and other talent to our teams as we increase production. Next, I'd like to review the sales performance of our business by region on a constant currency basis, excluding acquisitions. As expected, all regions posted significant sales growth in the quarter versus both 2020 and 2019. Domestic sales grew 55%, with international sales up 49% versus prior year. We are seeing strong performance across all international regions, with Asia-Pacific still growing despite an extremely strong comparison in 2020. We continue to experience robust demand around the globe, especially for propulsion products, and will be working through backlogs in certain product categories through the remainder of 2021 and into 2022. This table provides more color on the recent performance of the U.S. marine retail market, comparing the first half of 2021 to same periods in 2020 and 2019. As is usual for this time of year, there's significant noise in the month-to-month -month SSI data, but the positive market trends continue. All boat categories reported retail gains in the first half of 2021, continuing the momentum from 2020. Despite more difficult year-over-year -year comparisons in May and June, the main powerboat segments are still up 17% in the first half of 2021 versus 2020, and up 13% versus 2019. Brunswick's year-to-date unit retail performance is generally in line with market growth rates, with strength in outboard boat categories. Outboard engine unit registrations were up 5% in the first half of 2021 when compared with the same time period in 2020, with Mercury's first half growth more than doubling the market growth rate, resulting in significant market share gains, as I discussed earlier. As we enter the second half of the year, U.S. lead generation, dealer sentiment, 
and other leading indicators all remain very positive. Approximately 40% of the boats leaving our manufacturing facilities are retail sold, which is approximately three times historical averages. In addition, five of our brands, including Whaler, have all model year 2022 production slots already sold. All these factors give us high confidence in the continuing retail strength as we complete the 2021 selling season and move into 2022. I'll now turn the call over to Ryan for some additional comments on our financial performance. Thanks, Dave, and good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to share with you the results from another fantastic quarter. To provide perspective in the slides that follow, we have included comparisons in certain places to both the second quarters of 2020 and 2019 in order to highlight the outstanding performance in each of our businesses over the past few years. When compared with 2020, second quarter net sales were up 57%, while operating earnings on an as-adjusted basis increased by 126%. Adjusted operating margins were 17.1% and adjusted EPS was $2.52, once again setting new all-time highs for any quarter for which we have available records. Sales and earnings in each segment benefited from strong global demand for marine products, with earnings also positively Im impacted by favorable factory absorption from increased production and favorable changes in foreign currency exchange rates partially offset by higher variable compensation costs and increased spending in sales and marketing and ACEs and other growth initiatives. Finally, we had free cash flow of $268 million in the second quarter with a free cash flow conversion of 135%. First half comparisons are equally as favorable. Net sales through the first half of 2021 were up 53% when compared with the first half of 2020 and operating margins of 17% were a 520 basis point improvement from 2020. This resulted in first half EPS of $4.76 and a very robust operating leverage of 27%. Turning to our segments, revenue in the propulsion business increased 64% versus the second quarter of 2020 as each product category experienced strong demand and market share gains. Consistent with the theme from the first quarter, boat manufacturers continue to ramp up production in the second quarter, and our increased capacity enabled continued elevated sales to the independent OEM and international channels. Sales growth was also strong across all product categories when compared to the second quarter of 2019. Operating margins and operating earnings were up significantly in the quarter, benefiting from the factors positively affecting all of our businesses. In our parts and accessories segment, revenues increased 42% and adjusted operating earnings were 46% up versus the second quarter of 2020 due to strong sales growth across all product categories. Adjusted operating margins of 23.2% were 60 basis points better than prior year quarter with significant sales increases driving the robust increase in adjusted operating earnings. Sales growth was also very strong across all product categories when compared to the second quarter of 2019. This aftermarket-driven, annuity-based business continues to benefit from more boaters on the water, which is being augmented by flexible work schedules allowing for more leisure time, with the OEM component of the business leveraging investments in technology to take advantage of increased demand from boat builders as they continue to increase production. As anticipated, our boat segment results benefited the most when compared with the second quarter of 2020 due to last year's COVID-related plant shutdowns and production ramp-ups. Sales were up 80% and operating margins were 10.5% for the quarter, the second straight quarter this segment has delivered double-digit margins. Each brand had strong operational performance, executed their aggressive production plan, and contributed to the overall segment's success in the quarter. When compared to the second quarter of 2019, sales were up 22% and operating margins were up 160 basis points, further illustrating the foundational improvements that have been made in this business.
Operating earnings were also positively impacted by the increased sales and the lower retail discount levels versus 2020. Freedom Boat Club, which is included in business acceleration, contributed approximately 3% of the segment's revenue at a margin profile that continues to be accretive to the segment. Turning to pipelines, our boat production continues to ramp consistent with our plans to produce approximately 38,000 units during the year. Despite producing almost 10,000 units in the quarter, which is up 5% from the first quarter, retail outsold wholesale replenishment by more than 7,000 units, bringing dealer inventories to an all-time low of approximately 7,400 units. Our boat brands ended June with under 10 weeks of boats on hand, measured on a trailing 12-month basis, with units in the field lower by 50% versus the same time last year. Given our view that the industry retail market will be up high single-digit percent for the year, we believe that retail will outpace our production targets, resulting in our year-end weeks on hand to be lower than year-end 2020 by several weeks. We continue to work with our brands to unlock additional near-term capacity through automation, labor, and select capital initiatives, including the capacity actions announced earlier in the year related to our Palm Coast, Reynosa, and Portugal facilities, which will begin providing benefits by the end of the year. 2021 is shaping up to be another year of robust earnings and shareholder returns with pronounced margin increases and substantial free cash flow generation resulting from our outstanding operating performance in a healthy marine market. Given the enhanced clarity on our ability to drive growth in upcoming periods, we are providing the following updated guidance for full year 2021. Without including the potential benefits from the Navigo acquisition, we anticipate the U.S. marine industry retail unit demand to grow high single-digit percent versus 2020, net sales of between $5.65 billion and $5.75 billion, adjusted operating margin growth between 150 and 180 basis points, operating expenses as a percent of sales to remain lower than 2020, free cash flow in excess of $450 million, and adjusted diluted EPS of approximately $8. We're also providing directional guidance regarding the third quarter, where we anticipate revenue growth of mid-teens percent and EPS growth of high single-digit percent. Note that we believe that the Navico transaction, once closed, will be earnings neutral to 2021, as we anticipate Navico's post-closing earnings to offset the incremental interest incurred as a result of the deal. Next, I'd like to provide some perspectives on our 2021 performance against 2020 and 2019 by looking at first half and second half results. The revenue cadence for 2021 will look more like 2019 and 2018 than it did in 2020. The first half of every year has additional production days as the second half includes model changeover and holiday shutdowns. However, first half of 2020 was materially impacted by the COVID-related plant shutdowns. This resulted in the first half of 2021 comparing very favorably to 2020 in all of our businesses due to higher production volumes with additional earnings tailwinds from improved absorption, favorable foreign currency comparisons, and favorable changes in customer mix in our propulsion business. These factors far outweighed the headwinds from supply chain challenges, inflationary pressures, and higher variable compensation expenses experienced during the first six months of this year. Our first half performance this year also exceeded 2019 in every metric. As we head into the second half of 2021, we will face more difficult comps to 2020 as the company recorded record high EPS over the same period last year, and we will continue to be challenged with supply chain constraints and increasing input and freight costs. Although we are taking price increases across our businesses, we also anticipate moderated sales mix with propulsion sales trending more towards core OEM customers, more typical seasonality in the P&A business, and a higher percentage of overall growth in the boat business, increased spending on ACEs and other growth initiatives, smaller benefits from currency and absorption, and a higher tariff impact. 
However, despite more challenging second half comparisons, this continues to be a growth story. We anticipate expanding top line in the second half by double digit percent versus the second half of 2020, which would be more than 40% greater than 2019 with higher earnings as well. I will conclude with an update on certain items that will impact our P&L and cash flow for the remainder of the year. The only meaningful update relates to our effective tax rate for the year. Due to some fantastic branch restructuring work by our tax team and business units, we now believe our effective tax rate for 2021 will be approximately 22%, which is slightly lower than our estimate from our April call. Similarly, and putting aside the financing related to the Navigo transaction, our capital strategy assumptions have not materially changed. In the past few weeks, however, we have taken several steps to strengthen our overall liquidity and shareholder return profile. We extended and expanded our revolving credit agreement, which is now in effect through July of 2026, which now provides for $500 million of borrowing capacity, an increase of $100 million. In addition, our board of directors increased our share repurchase authorization earlier this month, and we now have over $400 million approved for repurchases, which we plan to systematically deploy consistent with our capital strategy. These moves follow our substantial 24% dividend increase approved in April as we continue to balance desired increases in shareholder return and investment and growth initiatives. We now anticipate spending $270 to $300 million on capital expenditures in the year to support, and in some cases accelerate, growth initiatives throughout our organization. This slightly increased plan spending is primarily related to the Mercury capacity expansion that Dave discussed earlier. I will now turn the call back over to Dave to continue our outlook comments. Thanks, Ryan. At our April call, we felt that 2021 was setting up to be an outstanding year for all of our businesses. And the combination of continued robust retail demand during the first half of the year and solid operational execution by our businesses has us squarely on track to deliver against our operating and strategic priorities. Our top priority for the propulsion segment continues to be satisfying outboard engine demand from new and existing OEM customers and expanding market share, especially in dealer, saltwater, repower, and international channels. We are continuing to invest heavily in new product introductions and industry-leading propulsion solutions that we project will enable top line and earnings growth far into the future. And we've also recently taken the decision to accelerate the introduction of incremental capacity. Our parts and accessories segment remains focused on optimizing its global operating model to leverage its distribution and position of strength in areas of battery technology, digital systems, and connected products in support of our ACES strategy. We look forward to closing the Navico deal and beginning thoughtful integration into the ASG business. We will continue to focus M&A activity in parts and accessories as we look for opportunities to further build out our technology and systems portfolio. The boat segment will build on its first half successes by continuing to focus on operational excellence improving operating margins, launching new products, executing capacity expansion plans, and refilling pipelines in the very robust retail environment. I wanted to leave you today with an update on the progress we've made towards the next wave of the company's strategy, highlighted during our virtual investor day in May and our recent press releases. In addition to the Navico and Freedom Boat Club transactions, and the start of shipment of the V12 600 horsepower outboard, which I've already discussed. Proof points in the quarter included the launch of the MyWhaler and CRA Plus apps for Apple and Android users, which advances the ACES connectivity strategy by improving the boat ownership experience, reducing friction across the entire ownership journey. The initial reception of these products is extremely promising, with more than 2,000 accounts created in the first few weeks and a star rating of 4.9 out of 5. And the launch of the Heyday H22 Wakeboat, a new leading-edge Wigsoft model, 
signaling a doubling down on this fast-growing brand appealing to a younger demographic. This model is already sold out through mid-2022. We're tracking well against all our next wave strategic goals, including the electrification initiatives outlined in May. Finally, I want to once again offer heartfelt thanks to our global employee population for all their dedication, effort, and sacrifices during what is still a challenging time for our families and communities. Your hard work has enabled us to seamlessly execute our strategic plan and significantly outpace our initial growth and profit expectations. We'll now open the line for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the question queue. You may also press star two if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. One moment, please, while we now poll for questions. Our first question comes from James Hardiman with Wedbush Securities. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my, my call. Uh, first, just two um, very brief clarifications. Um, the slide, uh, I think it's 22, the first half versus second half. I, 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 you know, I'm trying to take out my ruler here, but it looks like operating income is about flat uh, second half of this year versus second half of last year. But then, Ryan, I thought you, you may have said that, that earnings are, are higher um year over year there so so maybe just a, a clarification there and then is production up uh versus how you had previously guided it uh for 2021 hey james good morning uh yes yeah, second half operating earnings are indeed up uh over 2020 um eps is up a little a little greater than operating earnings but operating earnings themselves are, are indeed up in the second half uh, and then production, I would tell you, is, is right on track uh, to what we had guided to uh, earlier in the year. And, and despite a lot of uh, late nights and hard work with our supply chain and other folks, uh, we're, we're producing exactly as we anticipated. Okay, perfect. And so that leads me to my, my broader question as I think about supply chain um, and what the bottlenecks are, which is, I think, going to be the has already been, but I think will continue to be the theme of this uh, second quarter earnings season. Um, obviously, we've heard, heard from some of your power sports peers. It, it's clear that in a lot of cases um, that their plants are not necessarily at full utilization uh, because their supply chain is, is limiting the flow of, of parts and components into those plants. Given that your production assumptions seem to be um, pretty consistent. It, it doesn't seem like that's necessarily the issue for you guys. Um, I guess is that an accurate characterization of the current situation um, and that it's more of a, of a cost issue rather than a um, part and, and um, supply availability issue? Uh, hi, James. It's Dave. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's a, that's a pretty good characterization. I, I would say that we we deal with the kind of new challenges every day and every week, and, and so far I've been able to um, mitigate them very successfully. I, I would say the impacts to us really are certainly cost, but we are pricing to cover that. And I did note um, that we believe our price increases are at the lower end of the industry, but certainly enough to cover the increased cost. I would say that there is productivity impacts, though, we, we, we are uh, maintaining our production, but I would say that, um, that not always in the, we have some you know, boats and other things that we have to take off the line, wait for parts, bring back on the line. Those kinds of um, production disruptions just mean that there is a, a, a you know, that some productivity impact. But so far, uh, we're able to continue production schedules um, with some of those kind of manageable impacts. Got it. And then just lastly for me, I, I don't know if this is even possible just given all the moving parts. How big of a of a cost or a margin impact do you think that is for you guys this year? Um, you know, again, uh, you know, obviously there are some top-line impacts, although those seem to be 
smaller for you guys than the than all of the, the expenses associated with expediting and and uh, you know inflation and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I um, Ryan, I don't know if you have a good idea. I, I think you know clearly we are <clears throat> on an annual basis pricing to cover inflation as we understand it right now. Obviously, we're halfway through the year, so we don't necessarily understand everything. But our plan is to continue to do that. I, I would really measure this in kind of points of productivity, um, but I, I don't have a ready kind of translator into dollars. Ryan, I don't know if you... No, the only thing I would mention, James, is obviously the boat business continues to deliver on margins. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen the, the guidance creep up. I think the, the number 10 has made an appearance. Uh, and the official guidance for the rest of the, for the uh, full year at 10%. So, like Dave said, we're covering over with price, um, but it certainly is is uh, a bit of a headwind. Really encouraging. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Our next question comes from Xian Xiu with Exane BNP Parabas. Please proceed with your question. Hi guys, it's the NCO. Thanks for taking the question. Um, just on the pipeline, so it's down a bit quarter on quarter, and it seems like availability is still um, maybe not fully there. Um, do you think if the industry had enough availability, retail could have been like, I guess, how how much higher could retail have been um, if if there was enough supply? Is there any way to quantify that? Well, in the I did, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, in the last call, we did indicate that we believe that um, on an annual basis, retail would likely be up. Um, you know, I would several more points um, it, it, without without uh, retail constraints. It is very clear that people are buying what we can produce uh, at this point in the year. Now, we 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 are as we as we. Uh, begin to get through the prime selling season over the next couple of months. We will be planning to build inventory again, assuming that the market develops as we expect. So from nine weeks now, we'd expect to be kind of low to mid teens uh, by the end of the year. But right now, and probably through most of the year, um, it, it certainly is a constrained marketplace. I don't know if I could. Uh, you know, identify exactly what the the points are, but I would say there's several points under the free demand, under the free supply. Okay, thanks. And then on freedom, congrats on the acquisition in Europe. Just wondering how big the opportunity could be uh, internationally, and how those kind of boat uh, clubs are are received, those concepts received in Europe, and any you know differences between those models in Europe versus the U.S. Any kind of initial learning. Yeah, you know, I would say that the the appeal is um, uh, equal um, in the right marketplaces. Um, so, for example, um, uh, Spain, France, um, you know, some parts of Italy, certainly the UK, um, Portugal, southern Portugal. Those are all areas uh, where you have um, very strong interest in boating. Uh, enough people with um, financial uh, capability to um, to join a boat club. The concept is a little earlier in uh, in Europe than it is in the U.S., uh, but, but really when you think about it, you know, Freedom Boat Club was around a long time before we bought it and really had reached uh, an inflection point just probably a couple of years earlier. So um, as knowledge of the model um, becomes uh, wider, and as we um, professionalize that space with the same toolkit that we're using in the U.S., we think that the potential is really substantial. Uh, obviously, uh, Europe is our second biggest market for, for Brunswick as a whole. Very, very long history of recreational boating, both in the Mediterranean and um, kind of near shore Atlantic. So um, we'll be working um, quickly to in, uh, to begin to establish some of the tools and techniques, marketing, um, uh, kind of professionalize the space. Uh, we think the potential is very, very substantial, well beyond where we are right now. Great. Thanks, guys. 
Thank you. Our next question comes from Scott Stember with CL King and Associates. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Hey, Scott. Yeah, I, I think I probably know the answer to this just based on the commentary, but just wanted to make sure, have you guys, um, with the, the lead times, uh, you know, continuing to get extended ahead of any um, relief from on the supply side, um, have you seen um, any accelerated rates of uh, customer cancellations on boats? No, we haven't seen anything at all. Um, we know that um, some of our channel partners have um, you know, kind of potential second and even third customers signed up for boats in, in case the lead customer has a change of mind. Um, so we, we're not seeing anything in terms of um, increased cancellations. All right, and I know there's a little bit further out um, and probably more than you guys want to give guidance on, but just your initial thoughts on what 2022 could look like, whether from a retail perspective for both, so do you think uh, it could be an up year? And if so, how much? Hey, Scott. Um, yeah, well, it's probably a bit premature to do a market call on next year, but, but we do think retail will grow next year. That's our belief still. Uh, we talked about that on Investor Day and as well as the first quarter call. Uh, in terms of in terms of guidance, I, I, we're not going to update uh, the guidance that we gave on the Navico call. Obviously, uh, 825 to 875 was our investor day outlook for 22, and then we said that Navico we anticipated would add a net 50 cents or so uh, to that figure, and that's Navico's earnings uh, less the anticipated additional financing costs. So. That, none of that has changed. I, I would tell you, though, that obviously um, the, the jumping off point for 22 uh, looks like it's going to continue to be a little higher because 21 is coming in uh, nice and strong. So no, no, no real changes at all on our, on our view to 22. All right, just the last question. On last quarter, you talked about um, within ASG, you talked about um, your plans to install about 15,000 uh, of the the Fathom e power systems for internal combustion generators, I guess by 2023. Can you talk about the timing of that and how significant that could be? Yeah, so we're on track with that plan. That the 15,000 represented two things really. It re represented the Fathom and Fathom type um, generator replacements for marine applications, plus the replacement of generators in recreational vehicle applications, and we're actively uh, doing that. We, we have a number of uh, ASG team members located on site at RV manufacturers installing our advanced battery systems. And they've become so popular that um, some of the RV manufacturers are changing their standard content to include this um, battery system instead of a generator. And as soon as you move from being an option to being standard that somebody has to deliberately change, um, the, the volumes go up. Yes, so we're, we're, we're very much on track. Our uh, advanced systems group Connect business, ASG Connect, which you might remember is, is the part of the ASG business that works with both boat builders and um, RV manufacturers and specialty vehicle manufacturers to integrate our systems uh, was up 133% in the first half of the year. So it's a very in-demand service, and people are taking advantage of this great um, portfolio of, of um, technologies that we have and our ability to integrate it on their behalf. Excellent. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from Fred Whiteman with Wolf Research. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for taking the question. I was wondering if you could dig into the mercury capacity a little bit more that you outlined. Is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that incremental to sort of what you had hinted at last quarter? What type of capacity uptick are you sort of planning for? Where is it targeted? Sort of that mid-horsepower, high-horsepower, anything that you could provide there would be super helpful. Yes, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so, um, yes, it is all incremental to what we'd originally talked about, and it's being driven by very strong demand for our 
um, products, it is roughly the same additional increments of capacity as the prior increment of capacity that we put in during 2018 and 2019. And I would say, yes, it is overweighted to mid to high horsepower engines, and it's mainly in our Fond du Lac facility, which is where we produce most of our high horsepower engines, and also in the supply base that supports it. We have to make sure that our supply base is, is uh, scaled um, just the same as our internal facilities are. But just kind of connecting a few things, um, we remain in very active discussions with potential new customers for Mercury, but our priority, obviously, is to support our existing uh, OEM and other customers. And what that means right now is um, all of our existing, or the vast majority of our existing customers are ramping up their production, and and, the, and you know they need more engines from us. Um, that means we have to be careful about how we add new customers. It also means, and I'm, I'm kind of connecting with something that Ryan said earlier about the second half of the year, that um, we we don't have as many engines right now as we would like to, to provide to dealers for Repower, for example, which is a very profitable channel for us. So um, top priority is serve our existing customers whose demands are going up and up and up. And so it's the right time for us now to uh, add more capacity so that we can continue to bring on board new OEM customers and also have enough engines so that we can satisfy those high margin uh, dealer repower and international channels, uh, commercial channels, et cetera, that tend to, um, uh, you know, tend, tend, tend to have to fall after some of the big OEM customers as we satisfy their, their demand. Okay, that, that makes sense. And uh, just another capacity question on the boat side. I think that you mentioned you'd be at 50,000 units in terms of capacity by 23 now. I think that number in the past was something in the low 40s that you were targeting. So uh, sort of a two-part question. Are those numbers apples to apples? And then secondly, when could those start to hit? Uh, is that something that could show up later in 22, or is it really a 23 story? Um, yeah, so this this is um, this is new again. So we um, had uh, we have detailed plans that we're executing, and and in fact we're a long way along the way now to implement that capacity around 43 to 44,000 units, which is up from the kind of high 30s that we had earlier or last year, if you like. So that is reopening the plant that we call either Flagler or, or Palm Coast sometimes, and then expanding our Renosa and uh, Villanova facility in Portugal. That drives up to 44,000, but it is very clear that um, with the pipelines where they are and with retail demand where it is, um, and uh, with things like Freedom Boat Club expanding really, really quickly and demanding more and more boats, that that might that 44,000 might not be enough, and so we have um, begun uh, a series of steps to increment that 44,000 up to around 50,000. That will require modest um, additional investment, but is in most cases not a significant footprint increases. In, in a couple of cases, there is footprint um, inside um, mostly our existing. Uh, kind of land, but yeah, we th this is the 44 to 50 is incremental, uh, and we'll be working on making sure that we can, um, you know, introduce it as quickly as we can. But 2023 is currently the target. I would say that what we, you know, I don't know if we'll need 50,000 units, uh, but I know that the signs are that we might, and I would not want to lose market share, certainly don't want to short. Freedom, uh, which is growing like crazy, so we think it's prudent at this time to um, cost-effectively build out that additional op uh, optionality. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Anna Glaschen with Jeffries. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, first, on the Barado with uh, production sold out through 21, could you maybe contextualize this versus what your preliminary expectations were 
for the performance of uh, that engine? Yes, and thank you for the question. Yes, yeah, so, um, the demand for the V12 is going um, is is very high. I think it's attracting a lot of interest. It's it's uh, causing a number of boat builders to rethink their portfolio and put in outboards where they might have put in inboard engines on uh, bigger boats. So yes, the demand is certainly higher than our original expectations. Uh, so we'll we'll. Um, kind of work our way through this second half of the year. I think, you know, the comment that we made earlier was w without being very explicit about numbers to indicate, you know, we, earlier there were some other higher horsepower engines in the marketplace, but this is different. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we expect in the back half of this year we'll produce more outboard engines above 500 horsepower than were produced in the entire prior history of the industry. So the scale of this engine at this horsepower level is substantially higher than anything else. And uh, yeah, we're seeing very robust demand and a lot of interest, and, and it is certainly higher than we originally anticipated. Uh, great, thanks. And then, and then turning back to the um, capacity investment to reach that 50,000 um, boat unit number. So I think in, in the deck it was kind of presented as you've identified the ability to ramp to that. I guess are you committing to kind of those investments or when would that decision have to be made to, in order to ramp up to that by 23? Uh, it, so the investments are phased over time and you know we can uh, continue to uh, monitor the marketplace and, and any other developments that are relevant. There are some early um, pieces of investment that, that we'll be funding uh, even as early as this year, but uh, it will be spread over the next uh, couple of years. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew Boss with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Hi, uh, this is Kevin Heenan on for Matt. Uh, congrats on a strong quarter. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, about the boat segment margins, um, strong again this quarter in the double digits. I was wondering if you could maybe rank order the drivers of the boat segment EBIT margin strength and how you're thinking about the sustainability of those drivers as we move out of the pandemic environment. Thanks. Hey, Kevin, thanks for the question. Um, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. It is... Uh, volume, improved volume, which allows for better absorption. It is operating more efficiently throughout the facilities, and at least in the last, uh, you know, in the last couple of quarters, it is a bit of lower discounting environment, uh, given that uh, we do not need to provide support or much support to the dealer network in order to sell product. But in general, it is. Um, you know, it, it is certainly uh, those factors. The other thing I would mention is, you know, the new products that are coming out uh, that, you know, we talked about on the Investor Day, 122 new or refreshed products. All of those are being designed for manufacture at a higher margin than the, than the products that they are replacing. And that's something you've heard from us for years on the Mercury side uh, as we roll out new engines. But that same philosophy has now moved to the boat business. Uh, and the new products coming out are really going to be margin drivers for us. Great. Um, and if I could ask uh, one follow-up just on the P&A side, just, could you talk about the long-term opportunity for this business now that you're adding Navico? I think you've cited a $6 billion market in the U.S. I mean, how best to think about, you know, your ability to scale and remaining drivers of opportunity here, um, I guess, both in the U.S. and globally. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, great question. Yeah, so I think, you know, Navico was an important um, uh, addition uh, to our portfolio and, and our brands. It enables us to do a lot of things, but there are plenty of other opportunities uh, in that um, marketplace for us to build out our portfolio, I would say that, as we have noted, um, our advanced systems group currently sells um, about 25% of its 
products into recreational vehicle and specialty vehicle. And the six billion is only the marine portion of P&A. So as we um, become more and more successful in, um, for example, installing those advanced battery systems into a recreational and specialty vehicle, we feel as an, um, a right to win some other areas of uh, RV and specialty vehicle, leveraging the same or, or modified systems and technology uh, that we use in marine. So I would say that there's um, uh, room to run in marine, certainly plenty of room to run in marine, but also room to run in adjacent spaces as well. And Kevin, one thing, just, just to uh, put a bow on this, you know, one thing that we're proving out is the growth of our P&A business and the strength then of the aftermarket annuity uh, revenue and earnings that that business provides. This is going to be uh, approximately $2 billion and still growing uh, organically starting in 22, uh, which is obviously four or five times larger than it was uh, coming out of the uh, downturn in 2008, 2009. So just a reminder that the mix of our businesses continues to trend positive uh, and towards the aftermarket and uh, counter-cyclical portions of our business. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from Mike Schwartz with Truist. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, just a, maybe a broader question about how, how you think about you know product development and launch strategy, maybe portfolio strategy within the boat business. Just given some of the dynamics we have in the market today with capacity constraints and, and supply chain issues and, and just elevated demand and backlogs out until 22. I mean, how does that play into your strategy in the near term and maybe longer term? I think uh, good question, Mike. Um, I, uh, we, we always believe that over the long run, new product wins. Um, so we are not um, pausing uh, new product introductions, uh, not pausing up our uh, product development activities uh, because of this somewhat unique situation. It, it, you know, except in some really exceptional situations where we just, you know, we can't get parts or something. Or one of our suppliers says, you know, you can either have a production part or a, or a development part. Um, but it, but um, in terms of what our intention is, is we know in this marketplace new product wins over the long term, and, and we will continue to invest and not uh, intentionally, at least, uh, pause any of our key programs. We, you know, the, you know one of the the ways that that we are attracting into uh, attracting new people or people into new boats is by providing new technology, by providing new models with content they can't get in the pre-owned marketplace. Um, new form factors, new hulls, new um, connectivity, new solutions. So I think we, we have to continue to differentiate new product from pre-owned product, both from a you know, design and aesthetic perspective and from a technology content perspective, and uh, we will continue to do that. I'm particularly excited about uh, some, some of the stuff that's coming out very soon. Um, you know, the H22 from Heyday has been... I mean, the reception has been great. It's really, if you look at the wake sports market, it's really the value portion of that market that's been really growing. Uh, and so the ability to, to put a new product into that marketplace already sold out through 2022 has been excellent. And we will selectively, you know, evaluate expanding our portfolio into areas that we think, uh, well, we, we can really make a difference. Yeah, so that, that's essentially our philosophy. New product wins over the long term. We need to differentiate new product from pre-owned product. And, uh, and we'll get into more and more white spaces where we think the customer base is moving. Okay, wonder, wonderful. Uh, and maybe a question for, for Ryan, just on some of the commentary around product mix, I guess, being less favorable in the back half of the year. You've talked about some of your premium boat brands with extended backlogs. You've talked about the launch of the V12 engine that will pick up pace here in the back half of the year. So I guess what exactly is weighing on, on, on product mix? Is it just 
uh, OEM, uh, just the uh, OEM mix within the engine business? Yeah, it's, it's really two things, Mike. It's the, um, a, a, you know, the way the forecast looks for the rest of the year, our kind of core OEM customers uh, look to be getting more percentage of the engines than potentially our dealer network or international markets, which tend to be a little bit richer in terms of margin. Uh, and then just as a company overall, uh, the uh, boat business continues to uh, to be a uh, kind of a consistent uh, chunk of the of the revenue and earnings. And as P and A exhibits a little bit more normal seasonality, really in the fourth quarter. Uh, that's just kind of a, a, a mix headwind. But, you know, again, these are – this is a growth story even in the second half. We're comping against the best second half that the company ever had last year, and we're still growing top line in earnings. So, you know, we wanted to give a little bit more detail around it, but, but it's still a very positive story. Uh, trending into 22, which, again, we feel is going to be another fantastic year. All right, thanks. That's it for me. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joe Altabella with Raymond James. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, so first question, want to kind of delve into your industry outlook, um, which you revised today to, to up high singles for the year. And I think based on the first half, that implies roughly flattish industry retail in the second half. Um, is that a little bit aggressive given – you know, the tougher compares that we'll be facing, as well as the inventory situation, since it seems like supply is the bigger issue, you know, rather than demand right now. Yeah, I mean, Joe, that's uh, that's how the, the the numbers are shaking out. I mean, a, a very strong first half. Uh, we your your math is right, kind of a flattish back half, which is flat to a very strong back half, obviously last year uh, post COVID. Uh, but again, you know, our retail sales are up just from boats leaving the facility. So 40% of our boats leaving our facilities are retail sold, uh, which is continuing to buoy that number and keep it, you know, keep it where we think it's going to land. Um, but yeah, that that's exactly the thought process. We, 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 uh, we also do. Um, we we would expect to build some weeks on hand from now through the end of the year. As I mentioned, we're at nine right now and. Hope to be um, in the kind of low to mid teens. So we are building inventory uh, through a part of the season that obviously where the demand naturally seasonally uh, drops a bit. Uh, so yeah, trying to get the right balance is, is a bit tricky. I think it's going to end up in the high singles. Okay, great. And just shifting over to outboards, your market share gains there, you know, have been obviously very impressive for, for years now. Uh, it does sound like we could see additional capacity or additional supply, I should say, from, from your largest competitor you know, coming in the next few weeks. Might that impact or have an impact on the pace of your share gains in the second half? Um, I, well, I think that if you, know, if you look at our um, what we just described, when we talk about share gains, we're really talking about OEM share gains mostly. And um, we're continuing to drive those forward and make sure that we prioritize our um, our OEMs. Um, what, a lot of the, um, the share gains that we're seeing are from OEMs that we already signed up. So, you know, we have commitments from uh, OEMs. I would say that uh, in... in um, in contrast to uh, some of our competitors who have come out and said they are not adding more capacity, uh, we have come out and said we are adding more capacity. And I think if you're uh, an OEM looking to the future of your business in a growth environment, you would want to go with a person who says they're going to add capacity and has demonstrated that indeed they do. So I, I think we have a very strong, uh, we have very strong momentum, and uh, I, I think that our story around capacity and product is very compelling, and will lead to continued share gains. Great, thank you guys. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That is all the time we have today for questions. At this time, we would like to turn the call back to Dave for some concluding remarks.
Well, thank you all very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're very excited about the continuing very strong operational and financial performance of the business. Obviously, we'll continue to work hard uh, with our supply chain partners to make sure that we uh, continue to mitigate uh, issues, including things like uh, COVID and, and the Delta variant. Uh, we're also very excited about the significant early proof points that we've been able to establish on our uh, next wave and ACES strategies. Uh, it's going to be a busy second half. We'll be welcoming uh, probably 2,000 employees um, from, of Navico to the Brunswick team uh, when we close the deal later this year and look forward very much to delivering on the synergies and opportunities uh, between our two businesses. So look out for more strong performance. Uh, look out for some more exciting developments uh, as we work our way through the next quarter. Thank you all very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webcast. You may now disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation and have a great day.